Uh, our panelists um, are going to introduce themselves, but we are so encouraged. This e event is co-sponsored by Heights Next, um, which is a volunteer group in Columbia Heights, um, and they have some great opportunities coming up as well. So thank you so much, uh, and let's welcome up our panel. Franklin, can you introduce yourself? Um, tell us a little bit about uh, what you did for your career and your family and uh, current ways you stay engaged in your community. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to give thanks to God for the ones that takes care of my faculties, necessary faculties when I would take part in events like this. A thanks to Heights Plus, the young organization partnering with a very senior institution like First Lutheran Church, and to Nathan, who is the creator of this series. So, thank you. Uh, today's topic, of course, engaging as you age. I'd like to have seen a lot of seniors here, but. Anyway, I would uh, briefly mention what's happening actually around the country. Statistically, the engagement of seniors is increasing, it's on the uptick. Where the general volunteerism across the country is slightly going down. Could be because I think there are more seniors entering the ranks. As for as my story, how I am keeping myself engaged, this is not something that happens one day all of a sudden, you know, I'm retired and I would like to be engaged in the community. I'm one of those very privileged ones that have the opportunity to get to engage with the community from the very beginning. I grew up in India as an eldest son of eight, eight siblings. So you can see my engagement started right at that time. Throughout my growing up years in India, you know, grew up in a middle class Christian Lutheran family. And Indians, Christians in India are a small minority as most of you may know. Growing up with everybody, Hindus, Muslims, and every other religion you can think of, and the minorities of, you know, there's a class that is called Harijans or the untouchables. So, as I think back, my involvement with the current project, Pushpa project, may have something to do with my going back, my growing up years. Way back in the subconscious mind of mine may have, you know. My dad was a civil servant. He came from a very, very, very poor family background. He, grew up, he came up through the help of missionaries who sent him to school and college and which made him a good, you know, got him a good standing in the community. So my inspiration is looking back at how my ancestors have been and how they carried their lives through a lot of handicaps. So, so currently my pet project, my very close to my heart, Pushpa project, is, is a culmination of a lot of these things that have happened. That is, I was growing up, looking back into my family history, and when I finally decided that as the time is coming close to retirement. By the way, I worked, I came to America in 69. 
found a job with 3M, working their medical research group. Few months afterwards, I joined First Lutheran. This is the best things that have happened to me at the very beginning. You know, 3M and the First Lutheran Church. So anyway, so the, the Pushpa project has is born out of a lot of encouragement from friends, from community, and the family. When I was just about to retire, a few years before retirement, my mother-in-law gave me a plaque as a gift. I just want to show you. It reads, Help thy brother's boat across and low, thine own has reached the shore. So this black, this one is right in front of my working desk. I see this every day almost. So it's not, no, I did help my own brothers, but that's not what it means here, as you all know, brothers and sisters, here or elsewhere. So we chose to work with a tribal community that is the most neglected tribal community. Tribal communities live outside a village. These are once nomadic people that are brought together by the government so that they can live as a community. So what Pushpa does is we walk into one of these tribal communities, we talk to the elders, we try to organize them in a way that there are few leaders, both men and women, and then we offer them whatever help we can, not monetarily, to organize the community and to uh, provides some grant as a micro loan that they can pass on from person to person. So, and then we help the children with education. So, these, uh, this project, we started with one village. Come on, have a seat. There are seats right in the front. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, uh, the challenges of this, taking up a project like this, is not knowing the village dynamics, their community, their, the way they live, and how to get to their level. In the beginning, there was a lot of resistance. They did not believe us. They didn't want to work with us. And in fact, some even tried to drive us out of their colony. These are the people that are living outside the main community. In the main village, the landlords and all the other higher caste people live. These are the people that are on the outskirts of any village. Every village that we work today, they have a colony outside the village. We rarely enter the main village. And, you know, this is the condition of the people and they, for some reason, I mean, this is one of the challenges of working as newbies in a community like this. So, we started with one village. Right now, after 13 years of the work in, this, in these communities, we have 10 evening schools, one sewing center, which is solely supported by First Lutheran Church, and uh, we are planning to open a second one end of this year. For the first time this year, we have 12 kids that have passed through high school mm -hmm. in all these 10 villages. That means one or two here and there. And, and all of them have joined college. Mm -hmm. There is no guarantee that these kids would stay in college. They would some of them will drop off because the academic standards in some of these schools 
even our tutors could not equip them adequately to face the academic challenges they face. So we are very pleased with the progress that we have made and we hope uh, things would continue and as as we are getting older and the project is getting stronger and more robust and there is more uh, energy you know uh, we are hoping and praying things will continue at the same pace or even better so i'll close this with one sanskrit saying it says manava seve madava seva seva means service manava seva that means service to human beings is a service to god thank you thank you Franklin. that was amazing and so inspiring um our next panelist is uh darcy wills uh and she is going to talk a little bit about the work she has done um, in her community well i have been working in many communities i would say because I've worked north, south, east, and west. I was with Minneapolis Public Schools from 1977 until 2005. My first years of their, oh, my first years of working with them was uh, on-call positions until 1989 when I was hired as a mother infant care education per person. I was a high school dropout. I decided that I knew it all and found out a couple years later I didn't know nothing. So it took me about two years to study for the GED when I was about 25 years old. And from there I went to college at the age of 28. And I have a degree in recreation for special group services. I have a certificate of adult psychiatry, mental health, and of course the AA degree. And, um, and I also have a recreation uh, volunteer service certificate, two year volunteer service certificate. I have received awards for writing papers for criminal justice and recreation and rehabilitation. Um, for volunteer service, I have received uh, um, awards for that. In other words, monetary awards toward my education, continuing my education. And I have a bachelor's degree now in a bachelor's of science in recreation. I also after I, after I retired in 05 from uh, Minneapolis Public Schools, I decided that I wanted to study something I had interest in when I was young. So I studied um, forensic science. I did correspondence, forensic science, and I have a certificate in that. I studied private investigation. I have an, a certificate in that. I had a real, oh, ability to find things. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, well, these things interest me. So I said, I'm gonna learn something about it. I'm not too old to learn something about something that interests me when I was young. And maybe the opportunity wasn't there then but it sure did come. I still have many other interests. I'm considering going back to school again for another correspondence course. But um, I now tutor children. Can I talk about this? Yeah. I tutor children kindergarten, and I've been tutoring since, oh, about 2006. Started out with Urban League, Academy school and when they closed 
Then I went with Experience Corps, which is a type of AmeriCorps program for seniors. And we go into the schools and we work up to 15 hours a week. We receive the stipend of $120 every two weeks or something like that. Currently, because I have been with them so long, I am on what they call uh, a pay schedule of $4 an hour. I'm really rich. <laughs> but it isn't the money. It is the, it is the, the need of the, the community and of children to have assistance in learning. And it is the need for children to be redirected from negative behavior to positive behavior and to d redirect their energies in a more useful way for them, more productive way for, manner for them. So I, we are now considered to be somewhat mentors to children through the Experience Core program. So I do mentor as I have to. I listen, that is mentoring. I do not comment, I do not give advice, I don't answer or solve their problems. I ask them what they want, you know, and help them to understand what they want for themselves. But other than that, then we get right back to the job of reading. I, have, I am proud to say that all the children that I have worked with read very well. And I expect them all to either go to college, trade school, or something to acquire a greater um, uh, professions above high school diplomas. I have worked with my own family in redirecting their behavior into positive channels. And of course, I can use all my own experience to, to do that and myself as an example as a high school dropout. I encourage, so therefore, we've only had one dropout out of families of six and four and three, one dropout. And then I got him over here in Columbia Heights to stay with me while he got his uh, general, <laughs> his, uh, his degree, GED, general equivalency. So I feel good about that. Now I'm redirecting my, the youth in my family to go to trade school rather than college. And there are opportunities out there where they can go to trade schools that pay all of their tuitions. They can be tuition free without having to owe hundreds of thousands of dollars for college educations. And I tell them, hey, Go ahead and go to trade school. You still want to go to college? You can go to college afterwards. So they're sort of listening to me, but then sometimes I don't like to pound it into them. I, I pick up seniors to take them to food shelves and deliver their groceries and them back home. I pick up children for Christian education and deliver sometimes I had 27 children I picked up, three van loads full. Christian Ed was over at, at 8.30, I got home by 10. <laughs> and they really loved it. And it went from one family to another family to another family telling them, come and go with us, Darcy will pick you up. Hey, she might even buy you an ice cream cone. <laughs> oh, food always works for children, <laughs> sweets especially. So I do a lot, I take seniors to church, I escort seniors to doctor appointments. There's a lot of things that I do to, to help and serve the community. These seniors can live in Brooklyn Center, they can live in North Minneapolis, they can live in St. Paul. I will go that far to get them and to help. And I think that's it. Thank you, Darcy. Our next panelist is Pat Stinson. Um, Pat, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, 
what you did during your career, your family, and uh, current ways that you stay engaged in the community. Okay. Uh, I was born and raised here in Columbia Heights. I went to elementary school in this building. I went to high school in Columbia Heights. I went to college at Augsburg in Minneapolis. Um, when I was in high school, I wanted to become a navigator on an Air Force plane and navigate the plane from point A to point B in the dark. Yay. And, <laughs> and it had to be a cargo plane that could lift tanks and trunk, uh, trucks. I thought that would be a great thing to accomplish. And riding on the bus my senior year from high school, God said, no, you're going to be a teacher. So I went to Augsburg and became a teacher. Uh, an elementary teacher, and I went first to Austin, Minnesota, and was assigned to a small town of Lansing under the Austin School District, and taught third grade out in a field, and the cows and the pigs were out there, and sometimes the kids would ride horses to school and then send them home. Uh, I was there for three years, very happy, very nice staff, very nice kids, enjoyed it and wanted to stay but the longer I stayed I kept getting this feeling it wasn't right and it kept getting stronger and stronger and stronger and I prayed I said what's wrong and the Lord spoke again he said you need to leave you need to go on the mission field Okay, just I don't want to go someplace cold. I don't like cold. Can you make it warm? Well, he did. I went to New Guinea for two years and had a school, fourth grade and then fifth grade in the town of Medang. And then I worked also out in the jungle area near there. And I was also the principal of K through fifth grade and I was the janitor, I was the bookkeeper, I was the supply order person. Um, whatever there was, I was. I supervised the other teachers who were all New Guineans, and um, some had just a third grade education themselves, so they needed help teaching children. And so um, I spent two years doing that and had a mostly marvelous time. There were a few times I thought, oh Lord, I need your help. And then he brought me home and uh, I applied to Minneapolis and they said, well, you've got an odd background. We don't know if you can be in a classroom. So they let me be a substitute for a year and then after that they said, okay, you can have a classroom. So then I had a classroom and I was a teacher for 40 years. So altogether, 40 years of teaching or substituting. And then I retired. Um, I now uh, I help out at the library as a volunteer in what they call a conversation circle for people who are learning English and are reluctant to speak in a conversation manner with others, uh, they're still not with confidence that they can speak correctly. So I help them. And then I also tutor. We have a school that rents classrooms here, and um, it is not part of our church. Uh, many of the children are from other countries, and they have Muslim beliefs or other beliefs, uh, I come over and tutor them for a little bit in reading or math. My brother and I, we are block captains and we do national night out and we go every three, four months to hear about 
the latest information, the police department, the fire department has to uh, help our community in case there's a tornado or some drastic event. I go to Crestview, which is a senior center for uh, people that can no longer live at home. And we have a writer's group there. I enjoy writing. And one of the ladies was born with cerebral palsy. She has a hard time leaving the, the facility, so we go there. Uh, she's in a motorized wheelchair. She can use part of one hand to make it work. And she has a huge, giant mouse, mouse for her laptop and then a regular size one, so she can write with those two items on her laptop. And so we, we visit. Um, here at the church, I uh, am on the committee for uh, spiritual growth. Mainly it's sit and talk that I do. The others work very hard on other things, but I sit and nod my head and I say, that's a good idea. Uh, once a month, uh, we have a community meal and I come and help serve it or clean up. And so most of what I do is sit and talk, which I love to do, so it's no big deal. And that's about it. Thank you, Pat. Our final panelist is Phil Madison, um, and he's going to tell us a little bit about um, his career, his family, and the ways that he stay, stays engaged. Well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I was uh, born in southwest Minnesota on a farm, grew up on a beef farm, so I learned how to uh, work hard as a kid. It's also where I learned how to whistle, because I whistled at the cattle and it seemed to calm them down a little bit. Uh, after high school, I went to Augsburg College, now Augsburg University here in the Minneapolis, and uh, majored in chemistry, then went to Michigan State and got a doctor's degree in organic chemistry. And I was a research chemist uh, for initially General Mills and then for a German company that bought them out. And uh, because the paycheck kept moving, we moved from state to state, went from Minnesota to California to Pennsylvania to Ohio and finally retired back here. So we've kind of completed the circle. Uh, I've been married for 55 years, just celebrated our anniversary uh, a couple weeks ago. We have two children and four grandkids. The grandkids are 16 to 22, so they're on the path to independence, very, very varying degrees. Uh, in thinking about being active, I, I think back to the time when shortly after I retired, actually, Retiring was kind of a dramatic event because I was working in Cincinnati, retired, and within a few days, we sold the house and moved to Minnesota. So I, I didn't have time to miss the job. Uh, I was working in the basement trying to get it finished. And that was a learning experience. But it was a good experience because it taught me a little bit about woodworking. I am not a woodworker, but I like to work with wood. There's a difference. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> as long as it's simple enough, I can do it. Uh, so I, I kind of decided that I would like to avoid being one-dimensional. I'd like to do different kinds of things. So I listed five areas of activity. One is family, which I'm sure for all of us is a, is a big deal. And I won't go into a lot of detail there, but <clears throat> uh, one of the things that is a little bit different is that I keep track of the Madison family tree. My grandpa Madison came from Denmark in, oh, about 1875 or 80, something like that. And uh, <clears throat> he eventually got married, had 11 kids, and they all had pretty good families. So I keep track of the family tree as it progresses. And just this year, we passed 1,000 descendants, <laughs> direct descendants of Grandpa Madison. Uh, also went backwards a little bit uh, into uh, history in Scandinavia mostly of uh, going back actually as far as the late 1500s, which is about as far as you can go because they didn't keep records before that. 
like, unless you're a criminal or royalty. <laughs> Second area is church. I'm on the uh, hospitality and, and uh, outreach board and a bunch of other stuff. And uh, one of the things I really enjoy is that when we have a, a bunch of new members join, my job is to call them up and do a little interview to write a biographical paragraph for each person or family. Sort of conversation starters for the rest of the congregation so that they can say, oh, I didn't know you liked to read or that you like to uh, skateboard or whatever. And uh, it gives me an opportunity to get to know the, the, the new folks. A uh, little commercial. We're having new member, uh, a new member Sunday on October 14th, I think. All right? Yeah, okay. Anybody wants to join? Uh, third area is music. That's a big part of my life. Has been ever since I was a little kid. I remember sitting uh, in the, in the uh, big old farmhouse that we lived in. We had uh, little squares in the ceiling, and that's how the heat got up to the bedrooms. Well, my brothers, who were all older than I, would gather on the piano, and Mom would play the piano, and they would all sing. And I thought, that was so much fun. When I get big, I'm going to join them. And they did. <laughs> so uh, ever since, it's been an important part. And right now, I'm involved with the Augsburg Centennial uh, Singers, which is about 50 guys as well as a quartet from that group called the Four by Grace. It's a little plan where it's just four guys, so it's Four by Grace. Uh, and we have a fall tour coming up in a couple of weeks of outstate Minnesota, and then a bunch of concerts around the Twin Cities, and then in, um, Jan in February, we're going to be going down to Arizona to present eight concerts. That's a lot of fun, and a lot of work. <laughs> and you find out how old you really are when you have to stand up there for two hours. Uh, I also enjoy doing a little arranging and composing. Composing is really hard. Arranging, not so bad. By composing, you have to start with nothing. And it's hard. <laughs> so I stick to it more to arranging. Fourth area is mentoring. Uh, Prison Fellowship Academy is an institute currently at Lionel Lakes Prison, State Prison, and also at Shakopee uh, State Prison, which uh, brings in uh, people who are in prison who want to change their lives for about one year. They go through an institute, classes on everything from drug addiction to fatherhood to family life to uh, the blame game, and all, all those kinds of topics that, in fit, that, that in, uh, together, I guess you'd call the criminal thinking process and how to think in a new way if you're going to have a new life when you get out. So about six months or so before they get out, hopefully, they are matched up with a mentor such as myself. And we meet once a week in Lino and uh, get to know each other and try to build a bridge between us uh, a bridge strong enough so that later on when they get out, it's able to take, to carry some of the heavy conversations that, that come along. Uh, it works in general. Not always, but it works in general. The recidivism rate, which is defined as the percentage of people when they get out, uh, within three years, Reoffend and go back to prison. That's called recidivism. And the recidivism rate in Minnesota, depending on which study you use, is somewhere between 35 and 60 percent. But if you go through the PFA program and stick with your mentor for six months on the outside, the recidivism rate is about 2 percent. So that's a big difference. And if you think in terms of the benefits to the individual, the benefits to their families, the benefits to the community, the benefits to the taxpayer. It's pretty big. So I'm, uh, I'm, I enjoy being part of that. I, tomorrow I'm meeting in Lionel Lake with a new guy. So we'll see how that goes. The other part of mentoring is Freedom Works, which is a, a transition house in North Minneapolis. I've been involved with that. I'm trying to apply my woodworking skills over there to build book cabinets and whatever else I need. Uh, they are going from a very small place of about 20 guys to a new facility on Emerson, 
where they'll be able to have about 100 guys, plus they'll have all kinds of other agencies. Actually, it's the old uh, senior residence from St. Olaf Lutheran Church. And it's like three very large buildings, four stories high, and it's, it's quite, a, quite a big area. And it's a mess <laughs> because it's been vacant or unused for several years. And uh, so a lot of people are helping to put that back into shape, clean it out, and uh, recondition it. And I just started that process. In fact, I'm going over there tomorrow. We're going to try to set up uh, 16 feet of countertop for one of the secretaries so she can do her, her work. Uh, number five, kids and immigrants. Uh, I've been involved with the After School Kids program here for several years, but as I get older, I find that my personality and my gifts don't match very well as, as like they used to. Then I said, but I can pray. So uh, I spent about an hour or so while these guys are carrying the, carrying the heavy load. I just go in the chapel and Um, the other thing that I'm involved with is the test of tutoring that uh, Pat was mentioning. Uh, I'm currently involved in trying to organize that. We're starting this year on the beginning of October. So if anybody is interested in tutoring any place between kindergarten and sixth grade, we use uh, half hour slots. And we'd like to have a lot more slots because there are a lot of kids that really, really need the help. Uh, by and large, these are immigrant kids, uh, and a lot of them are years behind the grade level and need help. So if you can, if you feel you can do that, that would be great. Another organization is uh, SALT, which stands for Somali Adult Literacy Training. And the objective there is to help adults to learn how to read and speak English. And the summer has been kind of quiet, but I'm hoping that'll pick up again now in, in, the, in the school year that starts. So those are the kinds of things I'm involved in. Yeah, wow. That is amazing, all the things you're involved in. Thank you for your work. Um, as I'm looking through the questions we were talked about, I see that a lot of them have been addressed. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, what are the benefits you experience by staying engaged in the community? Um, anyone can feel free to ask, answer um, the benefits you experience by staying engaged in the community. One of the most richly rewarding benefits I have received is thank you. Young women who worked with me when they were young, whether they were in elementary school or in senior high school, graduating from high school or anything, or in the mother-infant care education program, they have come up to me and said, thank you. That is so good. And just the other day at the bingo hall, a lady said, is that you, Darcy? You, I was in the mother infant care education program. You took care of my baby. So now on my telephone, which I didn't bring with me, because you know, who wants telephone here? I have a picture of her baby, her daughter, today, and I have a picture of her as a baby. Now the baby I remember, but today I can say she is one beautiful little girl who is a very smart and educated woman. So I receive many thanks from young children. I had in foster care, a young man was uh, worked as a meat, he, worked, where he was a butcher in a grocery store. And he said, Darcy, thank you. Thank you for reuniting me with my father. I said, gee, I didn't even know I did all of that. You know, I mean, I knew I was hooking him up with mom, but I didn't know I hooked him up with mom and dad. I didn't know that. So it was, it's just good to get that pat on the back from the very people you help. One more example is when I was an arts and craft instructor in a recreation center, a parent sent me a note and said, thank you for taking all of my sibling children in. Because one was 
four years old and not five and didn't qualify. <laughs> and I let them come in anyway and put them at a table and said, come on and finger paint or draw a picture or whatever we were doing for that art program that project that day. But that parent sent me a card with a very nice note on it that gave me, again, thank you. What a wonderful word. Thank you. And I'm thanking you for letting me talk also. <laughs> One of the things I'm reminded of is a, uh, a lady who's a lot older than I am uh, likes to comment, if you don't use it, you lose it. And I think one of the benefits of being involved is that your everything works better, well, almost everything. Uh, the mind is, stays a little bit fresher, the body keeps moving, uh, a lot of that stuff. So I, I think that's a real benefit to me, anyway, of uh, adding years but not, uh, not, not losing too much capability. Things do slow down. When I go and visit the villages in uh, India and look at these children slowly progress from grade school to middle school through high school and college, I am very glad and pleased. You know, it's my own. Nobody says thank you in India, but I know they are grateful, but it's very fulfilling experience to see. And to see these young women learn how to sew and they are free to go and open their own shop sewing clothing for the women or they can sew for their own family. But, and also it works as a dowry for a young woman, you know, that she has, a, she has learned a skill you know, so it's easily manageable. So anyway, there's many, 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 many. Uh, I cannot, you know, say in few words how fulfilling this feeling is. At one time I was uh, volunteering here at the church with the program and I enjoyed it, but the Lord kind of showed me it's getting too much for you. And things kept getting worse. And so I finally did go to Nathan and said, I just can't do this anymore. And I think you'll remember that day. It was kind of a hard day. And um, I was sad that I had to do that, but I knew that there was a time emotionally or physically where you have to step back and say, no, this isn't for me now. Um, I have to do something else or not do anything. And as far as the benefits of what I do do, I learn from all of these activities. I have learned so much uh, working with different cultures and people. And I love that. And another thing, that's the greatest thing for me, is I do not feel useless. At my age, there are many things that happen as the body gets older and uh, the way the young people can, can kind of, they are helpful and respectful, but you have the sense they feel you can't do anything. Uh, that you're, you're past the ability. And, and in some ways I am, but I do need to feel useful. And so these are activities I can do, and so I continue to do them. But like you said, you can just do too much. You have to have a healthy balance, and for me, I feel very strongly that God tells me, this is for you, this is not for you, this is your, my plan, 
and you have to follow my directions. And, um, and it's worked all through my life. He's always given me the right advice. I might not like it, but that's the way it works out. But you've got a good point. Always, you know, watch what you're doing and make sure it's right for you. And it can change. What's right at one time might not be another time. I have a uh, thought that I would like to share. It's something that I picked up oh quite a, quite a while ago. Ever heard of the Plimsoll line? Plimsoll line. He was a, there was a there was a problem back in the British Empire back in about the eighteen mid eighteen hundreds of merchant ships being loaded down so so low in the water they could get out of the harbor okay, but when they got into a storm. It would capsize, and there was a lot of loss of not only ships, but lives and, and, and merchandise as well. And so by a, uh, a, a, a member of parliament by the name of Plimsoll got a law passed that says you've got to draw a line on every ship, and it cannot leave the harbor unless you can see that line. And that, that means that you can, you can probably do okay with a more heavily loaded ship as long as the weather's good, but when the weather turns bad, then you get into trouble. And I think there's applications for life, whether you're retired or not, that uh, you can take on so much stuff and do okay until a point where you know you start, you get the flu or something else happens or things things happen, and all of a sudden you can't do the whole thing, and then you either fail or you burn out. Neither one is a good choice. So I think uh, that's that's one of the things I like to keep in mind is. Uh, my, my plimsoll line, make sure I don't over, over, overload with it. And the other thing I notice is that my plimsoll line is going down. 